most of the materials that we encounter in everyday life are mixtures. Many mixtures are homogeneous. That is, their components are uniformly intermingled on a molecular level. Homogeneous mixtures are called solutions. Examples of solutions abound in the world around us. The air we breathe is a solution of several gases. Brass is a solid solution of zinc in copper. The fluids that run through our bodies are solutions, carrying a great variety of essential nutrients, salts, and other materials. Because liquid solutions are the most common, we will focus our attention on them in this chapter. Our primary goal is to examine the physical properties of solutions, comparing them with the properties of their components. We will be particularly concerned with aqueous solutions of ionic substances because of their central importance in chemistry and in our daily life. Learning objectives for, the, for this uh, model are to describe how enthalpy and entropy changes affect solutions formation. Also to describe the relationship between intermolecular forces and solubility, including the use of the like dissolve like rule. We will describe the role of equilibrium in the solution process and its relationship to the solubility of a solute. We will describe the effects of temperature on the solubility of solids and gases in liquids. And finally, we'll describe the relationship between the partial pressures of a gas and its solubility. So let's define some concepts. First of all, solutions. As we mentioned before, the solutions are homogeneous mixtures of two or more pure substances. In a solution, the solid is dispersed uniformly throughout the solvent. Here we have a sample, uh, an example where we have a solid that is in red and all the molecules that compose uh, that uh, solid and we have the liquid. When we put that solid in the liquid we can see here that the molecules basically combine and interact between each other making a solution. The ability of substances to form solutions depends on two factors. The first one is the natural tendency toward mixing and the second one is intermolecular forces. Let's talk about the natural tendencies toward mixing. First of all, let's talk about, about the gases. Mixing of gases is a spontaneous process. Each gas acts as if it's alone to fill the container. Mixing causes more randomness in the position of the molecule, increasing a thermodynamic quantity called entropy. So entropy is basically the measure of randomness. As higher the entropy, higher is the randomness. This, be, this is uh, with concern of molecules or in a solution, or also in a process. The formation of solutions is favored by the increase in entropy that accompanies the mixing. Here we have an example of oxygen, here in red, and argon in green. The, when we mix both gases, this, will, this process will be spontaneous because as we can see here, we have a large randomness than here in our left. There are some uh, intermolecular forces of attraction that are really important in this process. First of all, the dispersion. Some of these intermolecular forces we were discussed in chapter 11. We're going to make a brief review uh, on the, mo the most common intermolecular forces. The first one is the dispersion. The dispersion, as we can see here, uh, usually the white spheres represent hydrogens and the black spheres represent carbons. As we may know, all the atoms has electrons, at least one electron. This is the case of hydrogen. So the dispersion is the dispersion of that cloud of electrons that are created because of the presence of the electrons in the atoms. And that dispersion can create this interaction between molecules. All the molecules, at least, has this type of intermolecular force that is called the dispersion. Another intermolecular force that you may have heard before is the dipole-dipole interaction. So in this one, we have two molecules that interact because of this attraction due to the uh, charges, okay, or, or partial charges specifically. Acetone, as we can see here in our left, 
it has an oxygen here. This end of the molecule is a negative uh, di uh, pole, partial negative, and this end of the molecule is partial positive. This is for acetone. For chloroform here, also we have at this point the end that is a negative one, and this area is a positive delta, um, a partial positive um, end in this molecule. So this partial positive end of this molecule will interact with this partial negative end of this one, creating a dipole-dipole um, interaction and intramolecular force. It is important, that, as we can see here, that the molecules must be polar. So in that way, because they are polar, they have these two uh, ends with uh, charges, okay, with partial charges, positive and negative. So the negative, partial negative of one will interact with the partial positive of the other one. The uh, third intermolecular force is the hydrogen bond. For this one, as the name uh, itself says, we need a hydrogen, at least here. We have a hydrogen here in the ethanol. And also we need a lone pair electron, at least, at least one lone pair of electron that could attract, that could interact with that hydrogen. Here we have uh, in the right the molecule of water, one oxygen and two hydrogen. And as we may know, this oxygen has two lone pairs. So one of those lone pairs will interact and will attract this hydrogen that is bond to this oxygen. It's really important to understand that here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have one in the, in the back of, the, of that molecule. Six hydrogen in ethanol. But just one of those hydrogen can make the hydrogen bond because that hydrogen that interacts with the lone pair must be in a, in a polar bond. So here, the only hydrogen that is in a polar bond is this hydrogen with the oxygen. Because this hydrogen with this carbon, as well as the other ones, they are not polar bonds. So that's why you can't use this hydrogen to make a hydrogen bond. The only one that you could use from ethanol will be the hydrogen that makes a bond with the oxygen of the ethanol. That hydrogen is partial positive. So that's why this oxygen will interact and create that hydrogen bond. The third intermolecular force is called the ion dipole. In this one, we have an ion, and we have molecules surrounding this ion. And in this case, we have sodium that is a positive, it's a cation, it's a positive ion. So that positive ion will interact with the a negative partial end of any molecule. In this case, we have water surrounding this um, atom of, of, of sodium, okay? So here we have an ion dipole interaction. Dipole because we have a dipole in the molecules of water. This end is negative, this end is positive. Here is the dipole and the ion as itself, the sodium. So any intramolecular force of attraction can be attraction between solute and the solvent molecules. So there are some attractions that may need to be present when forming a solution. But first of all, we, uh, we may understand that we have a solute-solute interaction that must be overcome to disperse this particle when making a solution. So when we can separate them, then the molecules of the solvent could interact between them. So we must broke those interactions. Somehow we can we need to, 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 to broke those interactions between the solute and the solid. As well as we have the same concept in the solvent. We have molecules of the solvent interacting between them, and we must overcome those interactions, so make room to the solid to, um, inter, um, to get in, in between those molecules of the solvent. And third, the solvent-solid interaction, that is the one that we're looking for, so that will help uh, the molecules to interact between them and induce it to the particle to mix. Let's see an example by the solvent sodium chloride in water. So here we have um, the solid of sodium chloride, and all of this are the molecules of water, H, 2H, and one oxygen, sodium, and chlorine. So when we put them in water, some of those uh, ions are going to start to interact here with the molecules of water, okay? And that will start to dissolve that solid of sodium chloride. Here we can see that we have a chlorine ion here, and this chlorine is an anion, so it's a, uh, an, um, an ion with a negative charge. That means that that ion will interact with the partial positive end of the water, okay? That in this case is a hydrogen. The hydrogen is the partial positive uh, end of water. 
So that's why we can see here that the chloride interact with those molecules of hydrogen. In the other hand, we have the, molecule, the ion of sodium. Sodium is a cation, as we mentioned before. So the cation is a positive charge. That positive charge will interact with the partial negative charge of the molecule of water. That, in this case, is the oxygen. So here we have uh, the atom, um, I mean, sorry, the cation of sodium that is surrounded by molecules of water. So because each of these ions are surrounded by water, those, it's called, or, 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 or it can be named as the hydrated. Those um, ions are hydrated because are surrounded by the molecule of, of water. So that's why we have here a hydrate chlorine ion and a hydrate sodium ion because they are surrounded by the molecule of water. And when we allow them to dissolve completely, we can see that all the ions is going to be hydrated in, in the solution. Sometimes a formation of a solution will release or absorb energy. So here in this case, we have a solution that when we mix together, there is um, um, energy is released. So that's why this type of solution is called an exothermic. When we mix those, uh, the solvent and the solute, that, com that mixing will release energy and that solution, that process will, it is known as an exothermic process. In the other hand, we have that sometimes when we mix solution, the, that process will, will absorb energy. So that is called the endothermic process. But the important thing here is that we have a solvent that need to be separate those molecules and need energy. Okay, so in this case, and in this case, we see that we need energy, it's increasing energy to separate those molecules of the, of the solvent, as well it happens with the solid. So we have here the solid that we need to separate them and we need energy. So the total energy needed to make this solution, to mix those, the solvent and the solid, will be the sum of the uh, energy of the solid and also the delta H of the solvent. Okay, delta H that represent the enthalpy, that is the energy. And also remember that the randomness from entropy will affect also this process. Now, let's not, let's not get confused, okay? Because sometimes we will think that because we add something in a liquid and it dissolves, we are creating an aqueous solution. But that is not always the, the situation, okay? So for example, we have here um, nickel metal right here. We have a test tube and we have hydrochloric acid. So we are going to combine this nickel metal with the hydrochloric acid and see what it happens. So when we mix them together, we see here that the this was basically a transparent solution and it starts to, uh, to turn to green because there is there is a reaction, a chemical reaction occurring when the acid reacts with this metal, okay? It will produce uh, nickel chloride. And that's the green solution that we can see here. So if we allow that to react, at the end, we're just gonna have the test tube with this green solution. We're not gonna see nothing of the nickel here. And we may think that we have there an aqueous solution, but that wasn't a, an aqueous solution. There occurs a chemical reaction. And if we ha have the opportunity to remove, when we have just the solution of, of nickel chloride, if we have the, the ability to remove or evaporate the solvent, we will see something like this. And this is totally different as the nickel. This is uh, the nickel chloride um, hydrated. So because this is a different compound, this is a reaction. This is a chemical reaction. It's not the formation of an aqueous solution. So just because a substance disappears when it comes in contact with the solvent, it does not mean that the substance dissolves it may have reacted like nickel with the hydrochloric acid, as we mentioned in this um, example. So also there is an opposite uh, reaction or process for the solution formation, and it's called the crystallization. So the solution making process and the crystallization are opposite process. Here we can see when we mix the solid and the solvent, the solid will be dissolved by the solvent and you uh, will create a solution. But also from the solution, somehow we can crystallize the solid and we can have there uh, the precipitation of the solid, solid. So when the rate of the opposing process is equal, additional solid will dissolve unless some crystallize from the solution. If that happens, this is a saturated solution. 
if have if we have not yet reached the amount that will result in crystallization, we have an unsaturated solution. So if we are creating a solution and we are adding that solid to that solution and we see that is dissolved, that solution is an unsaturated solution. But if we keep adding a little bit of more solid and add a little bit a little bit more, and suddenly we see that we have a crystallization, that solution is called a saturated solution. And because of that, we can talk a little bit about this concept that is called solubility. The solubility is the maximum amount of a solid that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. That's basically the solubility. Saturated solution have the amount of solid dissolved. Unsaturated solution have any amount of solid less than the maximum amount dissolved in a solution. And surprisingly, there is one more type of solution. We have the saturated solutions, we have the unsaturated solutions, and also we have the supersaturated solutions. And the supersaturated solutions, we need to um, heat that solvent so that because of that will allow more solid to be dissolved. Okay? And when then when we um, um, uh, allow that to 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 to, uh, to take or to go back to the room temperature, we're gonna see the formation of some crystals. Okay, the, the, this uh, crystallization, and this solution at room temperature is called a supersaturated solution. In supersaturated solution, the solvent holds more solute than is normally possible at that temperature. But it's important to know uh, to understand that we can add more solid to this solvent and it will, be, it will be dissolved, but the only thing is that we need to heat that solvent. If we use that uh, room temperature, we're gonna, we're gonna reach that maximum of a solid at that te room temperature. It's not gonna be a super saturated solution. It's gonna be a saturated solution. But if we, add, if, if, if we allow that to uh, increase the temperature of, of that solvent and we'll add more solid, that will be a super saturated solution. These solutions are unstable, and the crystallization can usually be stimulated by adding a seed crystal or scratching the sides of the flask. These are uncommon solutions. Now, there are some factors that affect the solubility. We have, we're going to mention three of them in this uh, model. The first one is the solute-solvent interaction. The second one is the pressure specifically for uh, gaseous solutes. And the third one is the temperature. Let's talk, for, let's talk a little bit first about the solid-solvent interaction. As we mentioned before, we have uh, like four different of intermolecular interactions. And it's important that we need to have the, the same type of, of um, intermolecular um, force so that both the molecules of the solute of the, and the solvent can interact. This is called the like dissolved like, likes. Okay, this is the rule: like dissolves like. If we have a solute that is polar, it will dissolve in a solvent that is polar. If we have a solute that is nonpolar, it will be uh, dissolved in a solvent that is nonpolar. Okay, so uh, even though that does not explain everything. Why? Because the stronger the solid-solvent interaction, the greater the solubility of a solid in that solvent. Okay, and with the gases, we have a special situation, and it's because they only exhibit the dispersion force. The larger the gas, the more soluble it will be in water. Okay, so here we have a table that represents different gases, and as we can see, uh, krypton has a, a molar mass of 83.8 uh, grams per mole. And this has a higher solubility in water as compared to argon, oxygen, and nitrogen. So let's talk now about organic molecules in water. As we mentioned before, we have water is H2O. Water is a polar molecule. As we can see here, we have polar bonds. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So that's why the oxygen is partial negative and the hydrogen is partial positive because um, oxygen has the ability to pull those electrons close to him and removing for, uh, those electrons from uh, the vicinity of the hydrogen. But remember that this is a covalent, covalent bond and the electron, uh, they, are, they are shared between those uh, two atoms, okay? But the oxygen pull it a bit more because they have more electronegative and create those partial negative and partial positive charges in those ends, okay? 
So we have here a molecule of water, we have another molecule of water here, and this hydrogen can interact with this lone pair of oxygen creating this hydrogen bond. Same way here, this hydrogen will interact with those uh, electrons. This hydrogen can interact with other lone pairs electron of, of oxygen of another molecule of water, creating this network of hydrogen bond. So what about the organic molecules? Organic molecules, most of them, the, the, the basic uh, skeleton of those molecules are um, atoms of carbon and hydrogen. As we can see here, we have cyclo cyclohexane. We have six atoms of carbon and we have basically 12 hydrogens, uh, atoms of, uh, of hydrogens. All of them, we don't have their polar bond. So basically this is a non-polar molecule. We don't have uh, this hydrogen can't do a hydrogen bond because this is not a polar bond. Okay, so that's why this hydrogen can create a hydrogen bond with a molecule of water. In the other hand, we can have here a glucose. Glucose, even though is a is an organic molecule, but it has one, two, three, four, five, six oxygen, and also we have five OH groups. This hydrogen here can interact with um, an oxygen of a molecule of water. Okay and create that hydrogen bond. As well, the lone pairs of this oxygen here and also of any of the other, other oxygens can interact with hydrogens of the molecules of water to create that hydrogen bond. That's the reason of why glucose is soluble in water. That's why when you add sugar to your to water, you can dissolve it, okay? Because they can create this hydrogen bond between the molecules of water and the molecules of glucose. Here we have an example also of two molecules of ethanol, as we mentioned before. Here, this oxygen is creating this hydrogen bond with this hydrogen of the other molecule of ethanol. And also, this oxygen can create uh, a hydrogen bond with another hydrogen of uh, another molecule of ethanol. But remember that this um, atoms of hydrogen can't create those hydrogen bonds because, because those hydrogens are not in uh, polar bonds. Also, ethanol is um, soluble in water because the same concept that the, the, the ethanol can create those, those hydrogen bonds between the molecule of ethanol and the water. It can be by two different ways. With this oxygen and the hydrogen of water or with this hydrogen and also the, um, the oxygen of water. So we can have different types of hydrogen bonds between the ethanol and the water, and that's why ethanol is soluble in uh, a solvent as water. So polar organic molecules dissolve in water better than non-polar than non-polar organic molecules. So that means that, for example, glucose, as we mentioned before, um, they dissolve in water better better than cyclohexane. And the hydrogen bond then increase solubility since carbon carbon and carbon hydrogens bonds are not very polar. So, what about the liquid-liquid solubility? Liquids that mix in all proportion are miscible. Liquids that do not mix in one another are immiscible. So here we have hexane. Hexane is basically cyclohexane, but it's not a, a, a ring. This is a, an open uh, chain. But as you can see here, this is basically hexane. And this is water, and they can't mix. So they are immiscible between them, between the hexane and, wa and water. And it would be the same concept if we have cyclohexane, the one that we mentioned before, with water. We can see these two phases, and they are they, they, it is known that they are immiscible. Because hexane is non-polar and water is polar, they are immiscible. That's why we mentioned the concept of like dissolve like. If hexane uh, is non-polar and water is polar, they can mix. But if we have um, another uh, liquid as ethanol that is polar with water that is polar, like the sulfide, they will create just a homo you will see a homogeneous solution. So the solubility and the bi biological importance. Fat soluble vitamins like vitamin A are non-polar. That's why they are readily stored in fatty tissues in the body. And water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C need to be included in the daily diet, okay? Because they are water-soluble, so you need to add 
that vitamin C is um, in a daily diet to keep that uh, amount uh, in a, the biological levels that we need. Here we have uh, the molecule okay, of vitamin A, even though that vitamin A has an OH, but we can see here that this, it has a large area that is a non-polar, even though this region, region is here is polar, but you have a huge area that is non-polar, and that's why the vitamin A is um, known as a non-polar molecule, biomolecule. In the other hand, we have, see that vitamin C have one, two, three, four OH, and also have other oxygens then cat that can create hydrogen bonds with water. So that's why vitamin C is known as a water soluble vitamin. The second factor that affects solubility is pressure, specifically with gases. The solubility of solids and liquids are not appreciably affected by pressure. Gas solubility is affected by pressure. Here we have the Henry's law that is going to help us to understand this concept. We have here a piston, and in the piston we have CO2, and we have a liquid. It could be water. And we can see here that we have an equilibrium between some molecules that are, that are in the liquid and water and some that are in the gas phase. Now, what will happen if we decrease this piston? Okay, that will increase the pressure. What is going to happen is that it's going to affect that equilibrium, and that will allow some of the molecules uh, of CO2 be dissolved in water. That will increase the concentration of CO2 in water because the increase of pressure will increase the solubility of that gas. And at the end, we're going to have and we reach an equilibrium again but the concentration of CO2 now is higher than before because we increased that partial pressure. So the solubility of a gas is proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above the solution. And here is the Henry's law. We have that solubility of the gas as S is equal to K, that is a constant, times the partial pressure of the gas. Also, we can see here we have a, a graph of solubility versus partial pressure. And we can see that, for example, for any of those gas, gases, as we increase the partial pressure, the solubility of each of those gas increase. So that means that the partial pressure is uh, directly proportional to the solubility. As we increase the partial pressure, we increase the solubility. And we can see that uh, relationship here in the... Um, formula of the Henry's law. The third one, uh, or the third factor that affect solubility is the temperature. For most solids, as temperature increases, solubility increases. However, clearly this is not always true. Some increases greatly, some remains relatively constant, and other decrease. So for example, we have here um, calcium chloride that with temperature increase dramatically as, uh, for example, uh, potassium nitrate also increased dramatically. Others stay basically with no change as, for example, sodium chloride and other decrease. This is an example of uh, cesium uh, sulfate, okay, in this case, that it decreased that uh, solubility with the increase of temperature. For all gases, as temperature increases, the solubility will decrease. So that's why cold rivers have higher oxygen content than warm rivers because when we increase the temperature we allow those gas molecules to uh, escape from the in this case the water and go to the gas so that's why when we have uh, cold rivers we have a higher concentration of, ox of oxygen than in the warm rivers so basically this is the end for the first model of the chapter 13 properties of solutions